today, even already through the liturgy and through the songs that we've sung and the prayers that have been prayed, uh, that you will find um, you'll find refuge and, um, and and a way to to continue to walk forward. I've been looking through the book of John as you have um, at a much slower pace than you have maybe, um, and I'm just to chapter five, so. Um, I told uh, Ben that I wanted to preach out of chapter 5. He said, well, I covered that back in November. I think you're safe. I don't think anybody recalls um, what what I said then. Um, But I think um, I want to go ahead and and look at chapter 5 in the Gospel of John. And I want to read verses 1 through 17. Before I read that, uh, you may, as you you flip to that, you may uh, remember that this is a, a, a story about a man who sits by a pool longing to be healed. About 15 years ago, I had the opportunity to visit and and to go to Africa uh, for a period of time. And it was in that visit that we visited a village literally in the middle of nowhere. Um, And in that village, um, I experienced something I'd never seen before, but there was a, a pool of water. And this pool of water attracted people from all over who would come and they would sit in this pool because they believed that in that water there were healing properties and that by sitting in that, that they would be healed of whatever it was that ailed them or whatever it was that uh, um, caused their sickness. Our story this morning is about a man who does the same thing. For 38 years, he is set by a pool of water, longing to get into that water so that he would be healed. But this morning, we're going to see how the real healer meets him. Um, It wasn't what he is expecting. The hope that he had had for so long was dashed at that point, I imagine. And he didn't know what to do. But now he's going to see hope that shows up in the person of Jesus. And um, I want us to look at this passage and just to consider some of the truths um, that I hope will affect and, um, and change our lives um, as we consider them. Let me read John chapter 5, verses 1 through 17. I'll let you stay seated uh, this morning. Um, but this is God's Word, and I would remind you that this is not just some good story, but this is actually a story that really happened. It is true, and um, he has given it to us uh, for us to understand and, and, and to consider. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five Roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, he knew that he had already been there a long time, and he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up. Take up your, mat, up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who is this man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. 
Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus. Because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. Would you pray with me? Father, as we now look at this passage and consider your work um, and what you do here in this passage, I pray that you would meet us right where we are. God, there's no way that I can know the thoughts or the intentions or, or why people are here in particular today. I can assume that people are here because they want to hear a good word in the midst of a week where it seems like we've only heard bad words. And so, God, I pray that you would meet us and you would speak good words to us. But I pray more than anything that we would see you. We would see you far more beautiful than we've ever seen, far more capable than we've ever understood. And you would meet us at this unique place in our lives and in our world. And you would minister to our hearts. And you would bring comfort. The comfort that we long for. The peace that we long for. And you would restore those things new and afresh today. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so I want to look at three things in this passage. I've, again, I've looked at this passage over and over for the, I feel like for the last month or so, and um, I've come up with all different kinds of things to say. But um, here's what I want to say today. I want us to see and what I want us to learn from Jesus in this passage. And the first thing is we learn that Jesus comes to bring and to restore hope. How does he do that? Well, as the passage tells us, this is a time of a, of a feast there in Jerusalem. And the Jews have gathered and uh, they show up. But Jesus shows up at this feast as well. But he doesn't go where the large group of people are. He goes to a place where maybe there's not as big a crowd. It says there's a crowd there. But this crowd that is there are, are surrounded by people, as he describes there, that are invalids, that are blind, that are lame, and they're paralyzed. Let me read you a description of, of what one has said might, you might encounter if you walked into this particular place. It said the most obvious things that one would have seen was the mobility, livelihood, and social brokenness of this place. He said, but hygiene problems would have been glaring. If this particular man was a paraplegic, then it is likely that there would have been bowel and bladder complications. Many of these individuals were dependent on others to move them, beggars and recipients of charitable gifts to alleviate the guilt and sorrow some might have had instead of getting too close. Do you realize these are the invalids of society? These are the most vulnerable of that culture, of that day, in that place. These are the ones that were likely forgotten. And it's into this situation, it's into this mess, it's into this heartbreaking, heart-wrenching circumstance that Jesus walks. And he walks up to this one particular man, doesn't he? And he asked him what seems to us to be an absurd question. Do you want to be healed? I mean, again, for 38 years, that's longer than many of you have been alive. And we don't know the, the circumstances of this man, whether he was born in this condition or it was something that came later. It doesn't matter, except that 38 years he's been in this condition lying by this pool longing to get to the water, but unable. So why the question? And why this man? We know that Jesus understands his situation. It tells us in the text. And he understands that this man 
has been in this circumstance. This man knows his weakness and his need. And he's known it for so long that he may have forgotten just how desperate he is. I think that's at least part of the reason why Jesus may ask this question. It engages this man at a level that he's not been engaged, and he, and he hears from him, and he hears from this man's own lips, I can't do it. I can't do what needs to be done to be healed. But it seems that Jesus wants to give this man the space to be honest and, and, and to, to be truthful about his condition. And that's when he responds. I don't know about you, but I found myself in those situations before. Um, and it may not be paralysis of body. It may be um, a weakness that's been revealed through some other circumstance, through an action of a child, through something that somebody said, through something that something that I did, through, a, through something completely out of my control where I find myself and I find myself helpless and unable to do anything about it. Certainly, I have had times in my life as you where my inability has been highlighted. <laughs> and it's got flashing lights all over it. One writer has said that the gym exposes our deficiencies. If you go to work out, maybe you would agree. Um, it exposes uh, our strength and our stamina, doesn't it? But it also exposes our body, right? You know, we can come to church and we can kind of layer up and we're good. But when you go to the gym, I mean, you can only wear so many layers. Isn't it a lot easier to cover up the bulge in the, in the, in the, the larger places with, with things? And, and, and that's what we can do if we go through life and we don't, um, we don't live. We just kind of begin to numb ourselves. We, we attempt to cover up those, those bulges, those, those weaknesses, if you will. But what happens when troubles and difficulties hit is we are suddenly finding ourselves in what he calls God's gymnasium. And we are exposed. Our inner anxieties our hair-trigger temper, our unrealistic regard of our own talents, and our tendency to lie or shade the truth, our lack of self-discipline, all these things become visible and they start coming out, don't they? So have you been there? Have you been in God's gymnasium before? Maybe you're there now. I think in a real sense, we are figuring out as a world and realizing that, that some things are being exposed that we really weren't prepared for. These come to us in so many ways. It's the phone call from the doctor said, we need to run just another test. That call from your child at midnight, the lost job or countless other experiences. But what we see Jesus doing here is meeting this individual at a point of his greatest need. And not running away, but moving further into his life and inviting him to come with him. This trial or this difficulty of this man becomes an opportunity for this man to see a new object of hope and trust. Something that's not water, but it's a person. The others had failed. They had disappointed. And they had disillusioned. We sing the hymn so often. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. It's a great song to sing when you're not in the fire. <laughs> but I would suggest that it is the song that we sing when we are in the fire and when we are in those places of uncertainty and doubt and fear. I fear that I, as, long, as well as many other Christians, 
have missed the point of the Christian life and the idea of Christian discipleship. I fear that we have believed for too long that the Christian life and what, what Jesus is, is forming in us and revealing in this, in this man, in this passage, is your life is not a life where you're trying to grow more independent of me, but more dependent upon me. You've caught yourself in that position before? Where you think that what it means to grow in Christ is I don't maybe need Him as much. And while we would not say that, we live our lives in that way. I believe that this cultural moment can be one of those opportunities for us as those who are are Christians to ask God to teach us to number our days. Just like the psalmist says, so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Wisdom that shows us the temporalness of things. Things that we have believed to be unshakable are now rattled to the core. We will trust our abilities too much and we seek satisfaction in things that we can lose too easily. We need wisdom to see this in this day and age. I read this week of a, of a friend who said this. He said, uh, the COVID-19 has forced boomer septuagenarians, he's older, to admit we're now elderly and to act appropriately. It's humbling to admit your life is fragile, but that has always been true, and it's good to be corrected of the illusions of youth. Disasters have a way of exposing countries' strengths and weaknesses. And the same is true for us as individuals. I am helped in times of trial and suffering by looking and reading of others who've walked through trials and suffering of their own. And as I've thought about this passage, my my eyes and and heart were turned toward Johnny Erickson Tata. And some of you have read her books and, and are familiar with her story. Paralyzed for almost... 50 years after a diving accident when she was a teenager. She summarizes what she has found to be the purpose of her sufferings. She says, it teaches me who I really am. And I'm not the paragon of virtue I'd like to think I am. Suffering keeps knocking me off my pedestal of pride. And she goes on to say that her suffering has become her greatest mercy. We are not a people who do need independence very well. But when the fears and the troubling emotions overcome us in these uncertain days, when you feel alone, remember that there is one who has entered into this life not to make you independent, not to get you so you can stand on your own two feet, but rather to show you that you can lean into his strength and his power that he gives with great generosity. He restores hope as we find our healing in him, and he gives those fears and emotions as we give those fears and emotions to him. But we also see something else of Jesus. We see him demonstrating costly love here. Verse 8 is interesting. It seems that Jesus, uh, what he's doing right here, he, he does... To, 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 for this man, but he also has another agenda kind of running parallel. He wants to engage this group of Jews that are there as well. Let me explain. As he says there in verse 8, Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. Jesus did not have to say, Take up your bed. He could have simply said, Get up and walk. But it's that take up your bed that leads me to say and others that he's intentionally engaging and maybe some would say picking a fight with the Jewish people that are there. The Jews had hundreds of laws of what could and could not be done on the Sabbath. One of them was to not carry anything. So imagine yourself on a Sabbath walking around and nobody is carrying anything. But there comes this one man packing his bed. And I like to think that he was maybe hopping and skipping a little bit. Because he hadn't done that in about 38 years. 
he would stand out, should we say, like a sore thumb. So he's really easy to identify. And that's how they could go to him and say, what are you doing here on the Sabbath? Because he's the only one packing anything. It's interesting that Jesus conceals his identity there. Some believe, and I think they're probably onto something, when they say that he was more interested in, in getting before the Jews what he had done before he revealed his identity. Because he wants them to consider what he's done before they know it's Jesus. Now, make no mistake about it. As it says at the end of the text, what Jesus does is costly because it's at that point that they begin to pursue him and it's why they are after him because he is doing things on the Sabbath. But do you see what they miss? Do do you see this man who's been healed of his debilitating condition for 38 years is now walking and they miss it? Or their eyes go to something completely? I thought about this and just offer this. You remember when Captain uh, Captain Dan and Forrest Gump got his new legs and Forrest saw him at his wedding? He was excited about his new legs. But you don't see that here. You see these men upset that he had been healed on the Sabbath. What is Jesus doing? We could go on and we could talk about this. These are the Jews. These are God's people. They have a story. A story of God's love that has particularly been laid upon them. A story that has a history of of God's walking with them, guiding them, providing them, continually showing His faithfulness, faithfulness to them in spite of their faithlessness. God had loved them. And here, they fail to recognize this opportunity that's been put in front of them because they're distracted. And in this case, they're distracted by a tradition that didn't love people, but burdened people. These once slaves in the wilderness were now making slaves by their laws. What's my point? Let me try to work it out here. I read this this week and it it, it struck me about this passage as I thought about it. And it's in light of our current climate and current situation. It says, what if God in his strange providence is downshifting the American church into a mode of simplicity? Stripped of its non-essentials and grandiosity renewed in its fundamental identity as the people of God. What if the church in these days of pestilence were to be known as a people who are at least fearful of all, who are least fearful of all, who speak freely of resurrection as their final hope, who routinely expose themselves to risk in order to love their neighbors even when others in self-preservation refuse? What if Christians in faith, hope, and love were to pray not merely for survival, but revival. That God might use even this as he has in the past to catalyze an outbreak of his presence in power, widespread repentance and conversion, joyful and generous community, vibrant witness in word and deed. What if Christians, I would suggest, during this time learn to love their neighbors with the costly love that Jesus demonstrates in this passage and in his life? The Jews couldn't love their neighbor because they were hung up on a tradition, on a law that went beyond God's law. I have to ask myself, what am I hung up on that keeps me from loving my neighbor? It was a law here. Is it something else? Is it something very selfish and personal? Yeah, it is. Is it my agenda? Is it, is, it, is it what I prefer to happen? It is. 
I suspect that the leaders of this church, I know the leaders of this church, and because it's already been suggested, that in the coming days are going to begin to ask these questions. What is it going to look like to live as a Christian and to be a church during this time that we have no idea how long it's going to go? What's it going to look like to be a good neighbor? What's costly love look like for us? C.S. Lewis wrote, and some of you probably read it this week, during his time, and he wrote a paper or a little article on living in an atomic age, and it's been suggested that we can substitute atomic age for coronavirus. And this is what he says in conclusion. He says this is the first point to be made, and the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we are all going to be destroyed by coronavirus, atomic bomb, whatever it would be, let that, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint and a game of darts, not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs and viruses. They may break our body, but they need not dominate our minds. The greatest motivation that we have to love our neighbor is that Christ has demonstrated for us what it means to love your neighbor. Finally, we see Jesus' way of life is transformational grace. In verse 14, Jesus speaks again. And this is after he's gone and he's looked for this man in the temple. He says to him, when he finds him in the temple, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. After he heals him, and after the reaction of the Jews, he goes and he identifies this man and he offers these further instructions to him. Listen to what he says. He says, See, you are well. He engaged him the first time and asked him, does he want to be healed? As a way to kind of get him thinking and, and processing his, his situation and his condition. Now he asked him to consider his condition again, right? See, look, behold, you have been healed. You are well. <coughs> Excuse me. That word well means wholeness. He could as easily have said, you have been made whole again. And in these words, I do believe he's inviting him to see himself as he is now. I work at a tire store these days until the uh, call to RUFI is official. And the other day, a lady came in, and I had noticed her as we were working on her car, and as I walked back through the the, the waiting room, and I saw her, and I just noticed she seemed really happy. And as she paid and left, one of the workers who knew her said to me, he said, let me tell you a story about that lady. He said, she used to work at the schools, and she uh, was diagnosed with cancer. And she came out and she told everybody, she said, if I beat cancer, she said, I will never stop smiling. And he said, I've never seen her not smiling. I think Jesus appeals to this man and he encourages him. He, he wants him to consider his present condition in light of his past condition. What do you believe this man would say as he thought about his present condition? I believe he would respond with gratitude, that he was grateful. Jesus wants this man to see for the first time in 38 years that he is whole again. That this substantial healing has taken place. Sin no more, he then says, that nothing worse may happen. I don't understand all that that means. But it occurs to me, as you look at the, the way this unfolds, that first Jesus comes and he heals this man. There's nothing that is suggested that warranted Jesus coming to him except that this man was in a grave condition. 
Now in the second meeting, he invites him to consider what has occurred. To consider that he had received a great gift. And in response to this great gift he's received, he now issues this this charge to him to change the way he's living. The order seems to me to be very critical. That he heals him first. And then later comes and he calls him to live in light of what's occurred. What if he had told him to live differently? You need to change your life. And then he healed him. I think the gratitude might have been stifled. Or maybe even he could have been tempted, if he had done that well, to believe that he had somehow deserved it. It isn't get your act together and live for me, and then I will heal you. He begins the healing process and promises to walk with us and promises to finish it. He promises to walk with us with his transforming power. Jesus demonstrates his love and power first to awaken him to new life, and then he invites him to continue to live his life in light of the love and power that's been demonstrated. Why does this matter at this particular time and place in history? We don't know how long this is going to go. We don't know what's going to happen. We know that yesterday was probably unfamiliar to us. There was nothing to watch on TV if you're a sports fan. And you found yourself in this weird conundrum of what do we do now. And so probably that reminder at the end of the week that tells you how much time you spend on your phone is going to go up exponentially over the next few weeks or months or whatever. But Jesus wants to walk with us through this time. He he desires to us to reflect upon the gift that has been given to us, the grace that has been shown to us. And in light of that, to draw on that and to find the strength to live and the courage to face these days. Johnny Erickson taught us, says people ask her all the time how they could pray. And, and they, they tell her that they are really praying for her to, her to be healed. And she's heard that a hundred times. And what she says, she says, let me, let me give you some real things that I really need you to pray for. And they're like, yes, tell me. I'd love to pray for these things. And this is what she says. She said, would you please ask God to get rid of my peevish attitude when I wake up in the morning? I have such a sour disposition when there's too much work on my desk. And you know, I'm really a workaholic, so I wish you would pray about that too. And she continues on and on and and, and unfolding some of these things. And And I read that and I think about that because what she is saying is, I want to walk through this life each day facing the trial that God has given me and asking Him to conform me into His likeness. And we have an opportunity that is before us, not one that we sought or even desired, but it's here and it's the reality. And now as we walk as Christians, may God use it to transform us, to change us. May He reveal in us the reality of who He is. Listen, Jesus doesn't go to the cross to stop pandemics and viruses and paralysis from occurring. He goes to the cross to assure you through his resurrection that you will never walk through those things alone. And that is a great source of comfort for those who trust in Christ in these days. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you went without comfort so that we might have it, that you gave up joy so that we might share in it. We thank you that you willingly chose to be in isolation so that we would never be alone. God, would you give us wisdom? Would you give the leaders of this church wisdom as they discern the path and steps before them? And Father, for those that are here that are walking through the knowledge of this virus and they don't have this peace, would today be the day that they may be healed? 
We ask it in your name.